good afternoon viewers once again amitava biswas from sunetra family eye care center with our weekly episodes of patient education facebook live this being our 21st episode of uh, facebook live and this time we have a topic with a difference a non ophthalmic topic with an international stalwart from brisbane australia allow me to introduce uh, our guest speaker give me a moment i'll just switch on the share screen and uh, we have with us professor bala venkatesh from brisbane australia uh, i was fortunate and lucky enough to have shared with him the same hostel and the same class in medical school uh, he he as he did his mbbs as well as the post graduation in internal medicine from christian medical college and hospital velour uh, he's got a post graduate qualification in anesthesia and intensive care as well he has been a professor of intensive care and honorary professor in st john's medical college hospital bengaluru india he has uh, holds various posts in various hospitals around the world uh, he is also a professorial fellow at the george institute of global health which is they are located both in sydney as well as in new delhi he has got to his credit 10 plenary lectures and more than 150 invited lectures at international and national meetings over 250 scientific publications in peer reviewed journals he has authored two textbooks and various other academic achievements as listed in the slide one of the major contributions he has made in the field of research is that is he has developed a monitoring device the continuous intra arterial blood gas monitoring system which has reached clinical application of all the research or clinical trials he has conducted the largest one he has been a leader of the world's largest trial of examining the role of steroids in septic shock which was published in 2018 uh, he has also been a leader in leader of the australian investigating team of ethos trial which led to the fda approval of angiotensin 2 for clinical use in patients with septic shock he has got attachments in various institutions around the world various awards among them a lifetime Achieve achievement international award in 2004 for his contribution in critical care development in asia he is currently the fellow uh, of the australian academy of health and medical sciences and a visiting professor and examiner to the chinese university of hong kong as well as far as today's topic covid-19 is concerned he has got more than 10 international peer reviewed publications on the subject he has uh, set up a research network of, for covid-19 in 25 hospitals in india and is currently running four clinical trials on the virus infection Apart from this he has also formed a network for sepsis research in India and completed a large epidemiology point prevalence program across 35 intensive care units in India. With that on behalf of the entire team of Sunetra Family Eye Care Center and our esteemed viewers as well a very warm welcome to you Dr Bala Venkatesh. Over to you. Biswas um firstly thank you for that very kind introduction and it's a great privilege to be here and to be invited by Sunetra uh, Foundation for the uh, uh for your weekly talk and um, I look forward to engaging with you and with the audience uh and I'll try and um try and do my best to answer your questions on covid-19 
There are plenty. Um, it's been a dramatic year for everybody, and um, it's turned the world upside down. Uh, but we, but that's the world we live in, and we've got to work through it. So, um, so let's see how we can um, help each other. Absolutely, there are plenty of questions, uh, uh, Bala. To begin with, what time is it there back home in Brisbane now? Um, it is now uh, five minutes past nine in the evening. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, we are here at 4.30 in the afternoon. My first question to you, Bala, is why is the disease or the virus called COVID to begin with? I mean, can you clarify that? Yeah, so, so the, the disease is called COVID and the virus is the SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus 2. So... Okay. So the, vi the virus is called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's COVID, coronavirus. If you might recall, we had a SARS epidemic back in 2003, and that was the first SARS. And therefore, there's a second coronavirus, so it's called COVID-2. And the disease okay. is called COVID because corona, C-O, V-I is the virus, D is the disease, COVID. And... Oh. And it was in 2019 that the disease was first identified. Therefore, it's called COVID-19. Oh, really? I, I thought 19 is a kind of a nomenclature, part of the I mean, some virus uh, name or something. Great. That, that uh, clarifies my doubts as well. How does this virus spread, Bala? Like, I mean, can it, I mean, are there uh, infective agents like, say, flies, mosquitoes, ticks, or or pets or any other mode of, what's the mode of infection actually? So the, the, most, um, the most common mode of infection or transmission is through aerosols and droplets. Mm -hmm. So when we, it, it affects the, the lungs and therefore when we breathe air in and out, um, obviously the air that we breathe out can carry some, some small droplets which can contain the virus or when we cough, or when we sneeze, then the same thing can happen. Um, that is the most common. Now, in certain cases, the virus is shed um, in the stools, and occasionally they, that can be a potential route of exposure to some people. Um, the third most common way is when people who who, uh, who have this infection, and obviously, because they're coughing and sneezing, sometimes their hands can contain the, um, the infected droplets, and then when, if they were to touch a surface, then the droplets can then pass on to the surface, and then if another person comes and touches that surface, then he may then come into contact with the droplets there and the virus, and then he may get the infection. So the, this, is the, this is the sort of most common way of getting the infection. Now, people have asked the question, can, can mosquitoes and flies and ticks, can they all transmit the infection? To the best of our knowledge, the answer is no. We don't have any evidence to support that. Now, what about pets in the house? Uh, again, there are reports of um, of the you know of animals getting the viral infection, but again, there is no record of transmission from pets to the humans. So um, uh, you know, so, so pets can be and and therefore and but it's also important for people to remember that although we can use disinfectant to clean the surfaces wash our hands and so on, it's important not to use the same thing on the pets. We've got to use what's appropriate for the pet to, to wash them with, their, with, their, with what's, um, what's appropriate for the dog or for the cat that you've got of the pet in the house. Um, I know in, in the wild, bats carry the virus and bats have then been able to transmit it to other wild animals and it's thought that contact with other wild animals must have done the must have been the pathway through which it came into humans. Okay. Okay. So now you mentioned aerosol and droplets. So how far can these droplets or aerosol travel in the air 
for another person to get infected? That's a great question. Um, now, the 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 books and the journals and this is all based on work going back to early 1920s and 30s. They say that it carries for about to one and a half to two meters. Mm -hmm. The reality is it depends on a number of things. It depends on how forceful the cough or the sneeze is, number one. It depends on the ventilation in that room. If you've got a strong breeze, then it won't, it could carry far in that particular in the direction of the breeze. It also depends on the pop on the on the number of people in that room, which could which could impact on your degree of exposure. But generally, the the on on average, the 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 distance people talk about is about one to one and a half to two meters. And that's why people advise the social distancing for that particular distance, one and a half to two meters. See, uh, to be very honest with you, I wasn't aware of the transmission in stools of infected people. Yeah. So can that be a source of infection through, say, flies uh, who sit on stools or any other animals or predators who might uh, feed on that stool? Um, no, again, there, there is no documented uh, transmission of COVID from through through insects. There's not a recorded case to the best of my knowledge. Um, and, um, and interestingly, um, the, the contact again through stools is, um, you know, if a person accidentally comes into contact with, a, with an infected patient's stool specimen, then, mm -hmm. then obviously he has got it on his hands. And if, the, if hand washing is not properly done, then he's at risk of contact. It's like coming into contact with droplets. Um, the other reason, the other way, what people do, so some of the countries, what they're doing is that they, they are testing the sewage samples in in various suburbs, and if the sewage contains traces of the virus, and the sewage obviously comes through stool and urine specimens, so if if it contains any traces of the virus, then they know that there is some community transmission happening in that suburb or somebody is shedding the virus in that suburb. Correct. So uh, has there been any any conclusion so far um, or the, it's, it's just an ongoing study as of now? It is. It is. So, so I mean, in, in our, um, in Australia, there are regular, there's regular testing of sewage and, um, and where in suburbs where they detect traces of the virus, then they put the suburb on high alert. For, for symptoms and testing and contact tracing. Okay, okay. So they have found virus in the sewage at, at, at some places. Oh yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Okay, it's that's not the full virus, but it might just be part of the genome. But certainly, it's traceable. Okay, that that's important. That's important from the civics point of view. Uh, say the entire last year almost got wiped, got wiped out from 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 time in yeah. people's lives. I mean, everybody wants to know how long more is this pandemic going to last? What do you think? Look, we would all like it to end tomorrow, but um, again, good question. I don't think there's any clear answer for that. I think there are several steps which we will have to look work through. So uh, the, the world population is about 7 billion people. Mm -hmm. It is um, the, the total number of confirmed cases across the world is about 90 million people. Okay. Um, now that said, there are, there's probably um, unidentified rates of infection, and they think somewhere between 200 to 250 million people might be infected across the world. Okay. So there is still a large population potentially at risk, number one. Mm -hmm. And um, it, we now have the... Uh, so for us to become immune to the infection, we have to achieve what's called herd immunity, mm -hmm. 
which is when a substantial proportion of the population gets exposed to the virus, get, they get infected and they develop immunity, then the viral transmission starts to come down and the disease then gradually gets eliminated. And for that to happen, you need to have up to, up to 60% of the population being infected. Okay. Now, what's the, the, we have now got the vaccines coming in. So the vaccine, once you vaccinate the population, then of course, that will boost the immunity. But then we have to, we have to have enough vaccine, at least for three and a half to four billion people. Hang on, we'll come to the vaccines a little later. I'll no, no, just... I, I will come. I, I, no, no, I'll, I'll take your question on the vaccines in a moment. But I'm just saying that that is the number you, we have got to get to. So either we have to, the, the, those many people will have to get infected or those many will have to get vaccinated for us to say the disease now can't spread any further. Mm -hmm. So in reality, what you're going to see is ongoing transmission for some time. And whenever, wherever there's international travel or domestic travel or in situations where people can't socially distance themselves, then the risk of transmission is higher. So in reality, I think it's going to go on all of 2021, possibly 2022 as well. That's when we will see most of the world's population being vaccinated. At least till, till the end of 2022, I, I can't see this not continuing in some grade or the other. That, that's, a, that's a depressing piece of news, uh, Bala. <laughs> Look, it is. It is, I'm afraid. But um, that is the reality we are facing. I got it. I got it. You said 60% of the population need to get infected or develop the antibody for herd immunity to take place. Yeah. So that's 60% of 7 billion uh, population, right? Yes. That's approximately 4 to 4.5 billion. Correct. And right now, you said we have only about 200 uh, million only. Correct. And again, this is not uniformly spread across the world. They're all in pockets, in certain pockets. Mm -hmm. No, so tell me travel uh, resumes between these places of high infectivity and when they go to regions of low infectivity, then the infection starts to pick up in the low infectivity areas. Okay. So in this in this 60% calculation for herd immunity, uh, whatever vaccination or infection, whatever it be, uh, do you count children also? Are they at risk for, for getting COVID? Yeah, look. Um, once again, a fantastic question. The answer is, uh, well, they are at risk of getting it. They are at a much lower risk of getting it as compared to adults. Um, and when they get the disease infection, they generally do well as compared to adults. Why so? Uh, why, there, are, why? there are certain groups of children, people, especially the newborns and children less than one year of age where the infection can be severe, but by and large, children do very well. Why, why so? Why, why do children uh, have a lesser risk and why do they do better than adults? Um, because I think um, for, for, a, for a start, they, um, they don't have the chronic illnesses that adults have. So what they have found is that people over the age of 65 or people who have chronic heart disease or lung disease or people who have got diabetes are at risk of contracting the infection and getting a more severe disease. Mm -hmm. but children usually don't have heart disease or lung disease. Correct. Correct. That's a, and, yeah. and, it's, and also the, the incidence of diabetes is not as high in children as it is in adults. And it's particularly the type 2 diabetes, which is more common in adults, and the other ones who are at higher risk. So, so, so talking about children, do they also need to follow all the precautions for prevention as adults have to say, for example, washing hands, wearing a mask, physical distancing and all that? The, the same precautions are recommended for children as they are for adults. It is difficult to obviously um, enforce it with children. The compliance is more difficult because they are out there playing games, with their friends and uh, you know or the younger children may not be willing to wear a mask uh, it is more difficult but that's that's the recommended advice so which means um, uh, opening of schools public schools is still a dream then in 2021 um it's um it 
again, it depends on the level of infection in that suburb or in that school or in that community. Mm -hmm. So if there are suburbs where they've managed to contain the infection rates mm -hmm. and if they're able to screen students before they come to school and test them if they're all negative when they come in and if they've mm -hmm. got good uh, isolation precautions and uh, contact tracing, if they were to get symptoms and they isolate themselves, then it's possible to open the schools and run them. So, I mean, for example, that's something we have been able to do in Australia. We have schools are back again. Um, we did have a lockdown phase and there was homeschooling last year, but schools are back to being up and running. Since when? Since the, the, since the last term of last year. So since November last year. That's great. That's very good to know. Very encouraging. Yes. Uh, although we didn't have such a high infection rate as other countries. Okay. Okay. So I was actually going to ask you that uh, at least in India, there seems to be a downward trend of uh, rise of cases of, of late. Yeah. That's what the reports say. Yeah. yeah. So if you say that the pandemic is going to last through 2021 and maybe early 2022 again, that means we should not uh, make any relaxations in the preventive measures that we follow. Uh, we're supposed to follow in our lifestyle, right? No, so that's that's exactly right. So I I will not advise any letting down of the guard when it comes to all the preventive measures. Um, we have to keep in mind. I mean, I think for the first thing to say is that um, you know it's it's great to see the declining number of infections in India, but also one note of caution that the 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 number of cases that you identify depends on the number of tests that you do. Mm -hmm. So the testing rates per million population in India is not the same as or not as high as what have what is there in other countries. Uh, yes, I got your point. I get your so, point. So so yes, we India is identifying fewer infections as compared to September last year. I mean they were having about 75, 80,000 infections a day and now it's down to 15 to 20,000 infections a day. So yes, it is come down, and uh, but I think uh, we just have to be careful that we don't let the guard down. Um, it's winter, so the risk of transmission is higher in the winter season, and mm -hmm. it's going to be cold for some more time in India, and mm -hmm. uh, and people should observe the hand washing, social distancing, mask wearing, and all the other precautions. So I have two points from what you said just now. Uh, one is you mentioned about winter, the chances of infection spread being higher. Yeah. So what has the uh, spread of COVID infection got to do with the weather? Like, I mean, uh, is, is, is warm weather going to bring down the infectivity rate? Well, so, so generally respiratory lung infections rather are mm -hmm. more in the winter season okay. for a variety of reasons. I, know, I think it's the... Um, the air is cold and dry, and uh, therefore the um, um, it's the, the 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 mucus function, which normally uh, is important for preventing infections, the lining of the lung, which secretes what's called the mucus, um, that's reduced in the in the cold uh, wintry months. Number one. Second thing is when it's winter, we all don't go outside. We keep ourselves indoors and shut all the doors and therefore the ventilation is reduced. And so the potential for exposure between members of a family is high when you when everything is shut. So I think for these reasons, the, um, the risk of infections is higher. And, um, uh, and we also have to keep in mind that in India, particularly during the winter months, there are a lot of festivals. Mm. And so people get together. And again, the risk of uh, transmission during these festivals, when you meet people and when social distancing may reduce, then the risk of infection goes up. Okay. I got it. The other point that I wanted to ask you is uh, this over the last one year, nearly one year now, the general feeling among people in India, in my city, in our city, Calcutta, that I see outside is that people seem to have lost uh, lost their 
patience with uh, following all these precautions. So there are more number of people not wearing masks. There are more people going out to public places and malls, shopping malls, and say shows, movie theaters, and mm -hmm. eateries, restaurants. So meaning, uh, obviously, this adds to the added risk of spread of infection, right? You yes. said that we have not to lower our guard as yet. Yes. Even even at our even at our eye care center, uh, Bala, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Even at our eye care center, we follow very stringent rules of uh, sanitization, disinfection, screening at the main entrance and even inside. Uh, quite a few patients these days have expressed their uh, expressed their dissatisfaction or their annoyance with having to follow so much of uh, precautions. But we 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 tell them that COVID is still there, so you, we got to follow. What do you say? I um, I I agree with you 100% that um, um, you know I think that we have to keep reminding people that the disease the battle still has to be won the disease is still rampant and we have to be on guard all the time and we are going to have to be on guard for the foreseeable future um okay. yes the these measures are difficult they are exhausting they're both physically and mentally exhausting and no one is um uh you know no one is minimizing the severity of these things they are painful they are difficult but we have no other choice i agree um, with you till at least till the vaccine comes in when we can at least be a bit more confident till then we have to follow all these measures, perhaps even after the vaccine comes in. But certainly till the vaccine comes in, we've got to be very, very strict. Among the three main preventive measures in the lifestyle that uh, you mentioned that we all know, one is the uh, so-called uh, physical distancing, one is wearing masks, and the third is washing of hands. Yeah. Would you say that all these three are equally important or one is more important than the other? No, look, I, I think they all, um, they all, um, uh, I guess, uh, they all complement each other. Uh, they're not a substitute. It's not doing one more than the other is a substitute. It doesn't work that way. So, um, um, so f it's a, um, I mean, for example, the uh, hand washing is really in the unlikely event that you come into contact with a droplet, infected droplet somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we're doing that. So mask wear, even if you even if you wore a mask faithfully, that will not minimize the risk of you. If you don't hand wash, you can still get it. Got it. And and the same with uh, when you wear a mask, and same with social distancing. Obviously, when you maintain the distance, then the risk of you being exposed to the droplet is reduced. But if you wear a mask on top of that, it provides additional benefit. Mm -hmm. So mask wearing gives you um, a 15 to 20 percent protection. For the benefit of our patients and other viewers, can you in brief tell us that what is the best type of mask that a common man can wear for, for, for satisfactory protection? Look, there are, there are several ones available in the market, but most people are actually, um, they're both disposable and reusable ones. Uh, the reusable ones where you can wash them and wear them and they are as effective so you can um, you know you can fashion a number of people have fashioned their own masks at home from from old clothes and uh, you can just get a piece of uh, a, a piece of cotton and attach four straps to it and you, you and you can wear that as a mask and you can wash them uh, in warm water or soap water every day and reuse them so um, uh, I, I I think the main thing is um, having the barrier, number one, and obviously it's uncomfortable, and uh, but at the very least it reminds you having a mask, apart from being a physical protective barrier, also mentally reminds you that you've got to be careful, maintain your distance, and uh, observe the precautions as often and as much as possible. So, so from what I understood is that the main purpose of wearing a mask is to shield the aerosol aerosol uh, this thing spread 
right? Yes. Correct. So from the person who's wearing the mask to outside, or is it from outside to the person? It it provides it's bo both ways. Both ways. Okay. Yeah. So it, it may not be absolutely essential to wear a three ply mask all the time, is it? No, no, you don't need to wear it. I mean, look, if you have access to it, it's fine, but it's not. Um, I mean, even the surgical masks and so on, they. Yeah, the I'm talking about the surgical mask. Yes. So after a while, they, I mean, if you've worn them the whole day, I mean, you, even after a little while in theaters, they lose their efficacy anyway. Correct. So, Correct. You, so that's well known. Um, so, but it's it's just I think it 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 works more as a physical barrier. So if you've got a big cough, you don't splutter into the environment, and the same thing happens if somebody else coughs, you don't inhale because you've got a mask which is protecting you. Mm -hmm. So uh, my last question about masks, uh, Bala, is that is prolonged wearing of masks can it be harmful in any way? Uh, no, look, it, it is, um, it's, it's, it's tedious. It, I mean, it's, it's not harmful, but it's tedious wearing it all the time. I mean, so in some, for some people, having that strap around the ears can give you a bit of a headache um, yeah. if you wear it the whole day. Uh, some people, when they wear it during exercise, they could find it hard to breathe and they could get fatigued easily. Um, and so certainly in... Um, um, you know, it's it's recommended that when you know when you've done a heavy bout of exercise, you just you know get your mask off, take a good breath, and then you start again. Don't keep the, wearing the mask whilst you're doing very heavy exercise. So um, um, yeah, so so that's that's the sort of uh, general thing. But there's no long-term harmful effects from from wearing a mask. Um, we know surgeons wear them for hours on a day when they do long surgeries. And there are no consequences from that. Talking about this exercising, uh, it is very difficult wearing a mask during doing exercising. Yes. But does exercise does exercise actually add to the preventive uh, preventive factor or prevent prevention of spread of disease by by way of uh, improving the immunity of the person? Well, uh, look, again, I, I mean, in general terms, exercise is very beneficial. It has lots of beneficial effects on on multiple parts of your body, and one of them is immune boosting. And mm -hmm. so, the fitter you are, it's very likely that you've got better lung function, and therefore you are more likely to um, to um, to manage a COVID infection than if you've got impaired lung function. Uh, but that said, um, uh, there are to my knowledge, there are no clear data about the intensity of exercise and susceptibility or recovery from COVID. Okay. There's no data. Uh, look, I, I will need to verify that, but as far as I know, I've, I've, I've not seen any information to that effect. Uh, I mean, in your country, uh, are the gyms open? Are people going to the gyms? Yes. Yeah, so under certain very strict conditions, um, there's got to be a four square meter um, rule. So, um, so if the entire gym is hundred square meters, four square meters per person, so the entire gym is say uh, two hundred square meters, that means only fifty people can go into the gym. So it's got to be four square meter area per person, and um, and then obviously there's got to be strict mask wearing, and you've got to disinfect each piece of equipment that you use after you've used it before you go to the next. Uh, machine to exercise, um, and you're not allowed to be there for more than 30 minutes. In the gym? In the gym. Oh, I see. I see. I don't think in India, my gyms are following that uh, so much of uh, precautionary measures. Anyway, that's a good point taken. How important is nutrition or diet or uh, eating schedules? Protein versus carbs in improving immunity. Look, in in general, um, obviously, you know, you have to have a a, um, a healthy diet and good nutrition to maintain your body's immunity. Um, now, as you, one of the things, as you know, is that um, uh, obese people are more at risk of getting severe COVID disease. Uh, okay. So. 
and obesity is associated with um, with an impaired immunity in some situations, uh, and therefore um, that's that gives you an example uh, a of the association between poor nutrition and risk of COVID. Um, now, specifically, are they, I mean, is a carbohydrate diet better for you or a protein diet better for you? Um, again, I'm not aware of any data. There's been a lot of reports in the literature of, uh, you know, people taking vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc. Um, mm. Again, the evidence is not conclusive. Um, um, people have talked about vitamin D deficiency being um, uh, increasing the risk of COVID-19. And uh, um, uh, again, vitamin D deficiency has been reported to be associated with number of diseases, not just COVID. And therefore, I don't think, and, and supplementation of vitamin D has not been shown to be of any benefit apart from improving your bone strength. There is no beneficial effect of vitamin D in a number of other diseases where they think there's a problem, association between vitamin D deficiency and the disease. So um, the short answer is just your normal healthy diet is all that's required. No special diets. These days, the net and social media such as Twitter, Facebook are full of ads for, for uh, in, uh, what is that called? Uh, what uh, uh, intermittent fasting. Intermittent yes. fasting. Uh, it is said that uh, a f intermittent fasting of 16 hours with a eight hours eating window uh, adds to the immunity of the body. Is that true? Would you agree with that? Look, um, so um, there have been studies. Um, the, 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 the classic example is the fasting during Ramadan, which huh. the, um, the, the Muslims do. As you know, they do not eat between sunrise and sunset. Correct. So when they've done studies during the month of Ramadan on, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the people who observe these fasting rules, and they've shown improved um, uh, heart function, improved immunity, improved sugar control. Generally, the body's metabolism improves when you fast um, along those lines. Now, does it specifically work for COVID? I'm not sure. I, I don't believe there's any data to support that. Got it. So there is some benefit, benefits of that intermittent fasting, perhaps, but may not yes. be specific for COVID. Yes. See, another thing that we see nowadays is that uh, many people uh, are almost, uh, what shall I say, they, they, they have a tick of uh, you know spraying alcohol spray over every mail package, product, committees, vegetables they buy, any packeted food they buy, everything has to be cleaned, sprayed, and then taken home and then taken inside home or opened. I mean, is it taking the thing too far or is it ap ap actually relevant, this kind of uh, cleaning? Uh, I, I uh, again, look, it's, it's a great question. So th there is certainly evidence to show that the virus can survive on plastic surfaces for some hours, on steel surfaces, on wood and on some cardboard surfaces. So it can survive for a few hours. It's variable. And so what you do not know is where the package is coming from, or you might know where it's coming from, but how it's been handled. So in the interests of safety, if you're not certain about how it's been handled, a spray on that surface before you, you handle it doesn't do any harm. Okay. And the same thing uh, applies to your uh, to vegetables and so on. You don't have to spray with alcohol, but just wash it thoroughly with running water. I have also seen people walking around with uh, spray spray bottles in their hands. I mean, there are patients who come here with a with a sprayer in their hands, and uh, every time they sit on a chair, they spray first and then sit. I have seen people carry, carrying around such sprays and going to restaurants. Is that is that uh, is that okay? Is that good? Is it a good habit? I mean, it certainly can't do any harm. Okay. It's, it's okay. A certain, yes, uh, and I think I think being extra careful is good. Okay. 
good 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 uh you you mentioned earlier in the discussion about winter season one one is um, more prone to getting flu like or infections mm. this kind of infection i mean s- suppose one gets a flu how can one be sure that it is not covid or the other way around and can one get flu and covid at the same time yes well, you you certainly can um you can get flu and covid at the same time uh, there are different viruses mm mm-hmm. um um and um and so getting the flu virus does not protect you from covid or vice versa um and the symptoms are very um there are the core the symptoms are, i mean there are lots of symptoms are common in the two conditions and um in the current environment if someone has upper respiratory s- symptoms of coughing cough cold and sneezing and so on mm-hmm. we will check both for the flu and for covid at the same time okay so we you you you've got to check for that okay so what, what what is interesting though i want to point out is um i mean normally we um, in in the in our winter months we get large number of flu infections but in 2020 uh because of social distancing um mm-hmm. and masks and so on the number of flu infections dropped dramatically okay okay in your country uh, most people would be taking flu vaccine as well right yes we have the so we do have a flu vaccine but that happens every year but the flu vaccine is not 100% protective so if we were once we would see a spike in the flu cases which we did not see last year Mm-hmm. okay so physical distancing and wearing a mask are useful uh, otherwise other than covid also correct uh, suppose suppose a person does get covid i mean these days what we see in calcutta at least at least in calcutta from the hospital data that we have uh, is that the severity of the disease is much less than say what it was 6 months ago so the number of deaths are probably less yeah. is what we see uh, but are there any medications that one must avoid if one does get infected uh, i mean is there anything like that anything that can make no, it work? no so um no, so there are no medications which predispose you to a um, higher covid um severity um so very early in the piece um people thought that if you are on certain types of blood pressure tablets then mm-hmm. it increased the risk of getting covid infection mm-hmm. but that has now been disproven that's not shown to be the case now so i would recommend people that whatever medication they are on um they continue or are certainly take their doctor's advice before stopping anything not um do not stop any tablets by themselves because um they do not cause any harm or do not increase the risk of severity of covid so so in 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 your country bala like suppose a person gets infected by covid what are the what is the standard regimen of medications that you follow no so if pe- if people have um so covid can be various categories so you can just have a positive test right that's one that that means you've got the infection you can have positive test and mild symptoms which don't require hospitalization correct i'm talking about the such cases yes if those patients we do nothing we just watch them not they even paracetamol, not even paracetamol for the fever or the body that's ache. all they get paracetamol for the fever or for the headache uh we just advise them to keep themselves adequately hydrated with fluids and um just normal diet and keep us informed if they are getting short of breath if they develop other difficulty with breathing or if they have some chest pain or any other signs or they feeling light headed or anything like that then we ask them to come to the hospital okay. and once they come to the hospital then um then it um, again we we check the oxygen levels which is because the covid disease affects the lungs primarily and mm-hmm. if the oxygen levels are down then 
then one drug which is shown to be helpful is something called dexamethasone. Okay. And that certainly reduces the severity of disease and reduces the need to be admitted to an intensive care unit. Uh, this is an important piece of information, Bala. Yes, but, but again, please only take the drug on the advice of a physician. Um, do not, even if you have stock at home, do not take it. Uh, we would recommend go to the hospital, get yourself checked out, confirm that you've got COVID, and then the doctors will normally recommend giving dexamethasone if your oxygen levels are down anyway. Uh, you see, a couple of uh, couple of our, our own staff members, or team members at Sonetra Family Eye Care Center had COVID infections, uh, proven yep. they tested positive. They yes. had severe illnesses. They, one of them also had loss of taste and smell. Yep. And, uh, they all reported a severe physical weakness yes. even after two weeks, which went yes. on for another two weeks or so. Yes. I mean, what does one do to, to get by this severe kind of physical weakness? Yeah, uh, look, it's a, um, it's a good question. So, in fact, there is um, there's now something called, people are describing what's called long COVID. Mm -hmm. So, where the symptoms persist mm -hmm. for up to six months sometimes after the resolution of the initial infection. Really? Six yes, months? Yes, so people... Um, experience fatigue, um, um, generally being unwell, reduced appetite. Um, they have no, um, you know, it's like a, um, um, a, you know, a major stress syndrome that they've had. Um, and, um, and there's no specific medication for that. You've mm -hmm. just got to wait um, to write it out and um, just have supportive treatment like physio and um, um, occupational therapy and so on. Okay. Okay. It's but called long COVID. Long COVID. Okay. I, I'm, I'm coming across this term for the first time, Bala. Thanks for my education. Uh, I, this is something I learned today. See, we have had a very rich discussion so far on various aspects of COVID. And uh, let us come to the last and the concluding part which is the perhaps the, the most important part about the vaccination yeah. now the vaccination seems to be uh, there within the horizon tell us yeah. something about these vaccines how i mean wh what is your take on that and uh, which one is good which one is better why so um, so the, the so there are more than um, 100 candidates which are being tested as potential vaccines all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of those, um, um, three have, um, there's what's called the Pfizer vaccine, which has made a lot of international news mm -hmm. made by Pfizer. There's also what's called the Moderna vaccine, which is made by um, sponsored as Moderna. And then there's what's called the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is with collaboration with the University of Oxford in the UK. Okay. So these three have done what's called the phase three trials, and they have reported their results. Okay. The, um, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, they say it's about 90 to 95% effective. Mm -hmm. The uh, Oxford vaccine is about 65 to 70% effective. Okay. So um, now there are other vaccines. There's a vaccine from China. Mm -hmm. There's a vaccine from the Middle East. India is developing its own vaccine. Um, and there's a vaccine in South America, which is being tried. There are lots of vaccines there. Um, but only these three are now on the international market and are being distributed world over. Uh, the Chinese vaccine as well is being done. Now, um, the Pfizer vaccine requires what is called the cold chain. It requires a minus 80 distribution mechanism. It needs a minus 80 degree centigrade temperature to be maintained all the way till it's ready for administration. That's, so that's a challenge. 
particularly in large countries like India and where the weather is warm and maintaining a cold chain is not easy. The Oxford vaccine, on the other hand, does not require a cold chain of that nature. Now, people are asked the question, is a 60%, now the Oxford doesn't need it, it's more effective, oh, it's, um, it's more practical, but it's only got 60% efficacy, is that, is that okay? And the answer is, look, 60% is still good. Um, now, that is the vaccine which most people in Australia will get, the Oxford vaccine. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and the reason I say that is, if you take a mask, the mask is only, if you don't take a vaccine, then you've got to work with a mask and social distancing and so on. And the mask is only 15 to 20% effective. Mm -hmm. So anything which gives you 60% efficacy is much better than something which only gives you 15 to 20% efficacy. That's the first thing to keep in mind. And the second thing is, if a large proportion of the population get 60% uh, efficacy, or the, the vaccine there, then by, uh, you know, and purely through that process, eventually you will get to herd immunity much faster than if you don't take the vaccine or you're waiting for the Pfizer vaccine to come through. So it'll take a long time. So, um, I, I, and the other question that people have is, are there side effects of the vaccine? Correct. And, um, and that's, again, a very important question. And it's a very, very legitimate question. Now, most, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, most, vac they've all been proven to be safe. The only thing with the Pfizer vaccine is in people who have got severe allergic reactions, if they've got a clear history of allergic reaction to drugs, then there's a higher risk of allergic reaction to the Pfizer vaccine. Okay. But if you don't have a risk of allergy to major allergy to any drug, then the Pfizer vaccine will be fine. And the risk of and the side effects of the Moderna vaccine and the other vaccines are all, um, um, you know, like any flu vaccine, you know, the side effects are not too bad. Um, and um, your standard, you know, you get aches and pains and a bit of fever for a day. They're generally good. And th the third thing to keep in mind is that these vaccines, they, even if they do not reduce the chance of an infection, a lot of them reduce the chance of severe disease. Okay. So even if you get an infection, it might just be a mild disease. Okay. Gotcha. So... I think for a variety of reasons, on the grounds that it will either reduce the risk of infection or reduce the risk of severe infection, mm -hmm. minimal side effects, um, you know, these three vaccine candidates are promising. Have you guys got vaccinated and they're in Australia? No, uh, we are starting next month. Okay. Uh, in, in our country, the distribution has started today. Right. Fantastic. Yeah, so very soon uh, this we health workers might might receive it. Good. What is the what is the dosage schedule of this of this of these vaccines? Look, I, I look I will need to look into that, but I think the Pfizer vaccine is certainly two doses three weeks apart. Um, the Oxford vaccine is also two doses, but I'm not sure what's the interval between the two. Um, uh -huh. But they, I think they're all working around two doses. Two doses at, at one month apart? The Pfizer is three weeks apart. Okay, I heard uh, there is some vaccine which is 12 weeks apart. Which is that? Look, I, Biswas, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know which one that is. One of, one of our classmates posted in our group. Uh, right. The, so I was wondering which one is that. See, uh, there is one of the viewers has posted a question. Yes. What, what happens if a person has a history of Stephen Johnson syndrome? Should they go for any vaccine or not? There is, um, um, again, um, there is no documented Stephen Johnson's reactions reported with these vaccines. Um, um, it is, um, so Stephen Johnson's is a, it's a type of a reaction to a drug. It's commonly you get with certain antibiotics and so on or other agents. Uh -huh. 
Um, and um, again, the the um, is there a risk of um, uh, high, severe allergic reactions to the Pfizer vaccine? If you have Stephen Johnson's, I'm not. I don't think there's enough data on that one. Um, with the Oxford vaccine, I think the risk will certainly be far, far less of any major allergic reactions. So if the Oxford vaccine is available, then he should he could certainly discuss with his doctor uh, and um, consider you know the safety and the risks involved. Uh, but I would uh, I think to my knowledge the the risk has not been reported. Okay. Uh, my, my, my last question on vaccines, uh, Bala, uh, are these vaccines, the ones you mentioned, which are available or going to get available, are they for only adults or for all for adults and children both? So, um, look, um, a, a terrific question. The, all the tests, uh, the Pfizer vaccine was done, the evaluation was done in people over the age of 16. Okay. The Moderna vaccine was tested in adults. Mm -hmm. And I think the Oxford vaccine was also tested in adults. Mm -hmm. um, I could stand corrected with that one, but I, I think that's also in adults. So, um, so a, certainly children, there's a talk about children over the age of 12 should be considered. Um, but at this stage, um, there is, um, you know, as far as I know, there are no published data on on the protection in children or the safety in children. Okay. So which means uh, people below the age of 20, 21 need not get vaccinated right away. Oh, no, I think uh, certainly, I mean, uh, certainly there's data over the age of 16. So, you know, anyone over the age of 16 can get... If there's an opportunity to get vaccinated, they should get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Great. There's a there's a comment from uh, Dr. Framal Das who thanks you and is written thanks, Professor. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we also I'm have another of our classmates, uh, Sujata Charles, uh, uh, listening to the show. Right. And you have actually clarified a lot of uh, cobwebs and gray areas about this on this subject. And uh, people who have listened to this program and others who are going to listen to it later on are going to get benefited immensely. I must thank you uh, on behalf of our center for accepting the invitation and eliminating us. If there's anything else you would like to say in conclusion, then we will, with your parting words of conclusion, we'll probably end the show for today. Well, Biswas, thank you. Firstly, it's been a great honor and a privilege to have um, interacted with you and with Sunetra and with all the um, members of the public. And um, look, I only want to say one thing. Look, it has been a very difficult year for all of us. But, um, you know, never has the world come together as a group um, in circumstances like this than what's happened during COVID. The world is united. There have been, you know, sporadic, you know, disagreements, fights, and so on and so forth. But by and large, people have come together. The medical community has never united like this before. So everybody is fighting towards one goal. And so I'm confident that with the spirit that we have uh, and with, you know, with uh, a common goal that we have to overcome this, this pathogen, I'm sure we will prevail. So most importantly, please continue to observe all precautions and stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Yes, uh, Venki, I'll reiterate that too for, for the benefit of our patients uh, that we must continue to follow all the precautions. Well, well said and well taken. And we will meet again with you for some other show in the future on either a related or a different topic. It, it was wonderful experience sitting with you and chatting with you live on the show. 
Thank you, Biswas. And thank you all for joining me. My best wishes and regards to you, to your family. And uh, have a good, good night. And uh, we'll, we'll end the show here. Thank you once again. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night.